Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Warp Core podcast. This is our very first recording since hitting 1,000 subscribers here at Pending Rebrand. Thank you, each and every one of you, for clicking that button down below, digging through those archives, watching those shorts with your friend Hank Hill, and all the other great stuff that we have to offer. We appreciate you. And by no means have we saved a bad episode for you. We have something that you're going to want to dig into. You're going to want to get into this great discussion around this. Very much an episode of Star Trek, the original series. We're going to give you all a piece of the action tonight. Furt Derby, give us some background on this entry in season two of Star Trek, the original series. Hey, go your jets, will ya? I'll get to it when I'm done. Uh, thank you, Trekkie subscribers, pending rebrand fans, and everyone out there in the known universe for making us go over that magic milestone of 1,000. We're cruising all the way now to the next 1,000 and beyond. It's not going to take a five-year mission for us to give you tremendous entertainment uh, shorts with dogs and children, long-form discussions about science fiction's best franchises, tips on losing weight, and so much more. You just wait till football season starts again. But in any event, we do want to thank you. Uh, what a long, strange trip it's been, and uh, the best is still here to come. And we are on a piece of the action, aired on... January 12th, 1968, and to follow the sheer lunacy that was the game Gamesters of Triskillian uh, is an unenviable task. Uh, luckily, we were in some pretty good hands, both in front of the camera and behind. We had a new director, in fact. His name was James Comack. Uh, his career uh, credentials include producer, director, writer, actor, and stand-up comedian. Uh, amongst his directing credits, he does seem to have a comic background. Uh, he directed episodes of Chico and the Man and Welcome Back, Cotter. So, uh, 70s situation television comedies uh, after he worked on Star Trek. And he also directed the big screen uh, threequel, Porky's Revenge. And if you're a fan of the franchise, you can uh, debate whether the merits of Porky's Revenge holds up to Porky's or Porky's 2 the next day. But uh, James Comack was the man guiding uh, that final uh, chapter in the trilogy. And, uh, and of course, uh, we all fondly remember when you could make movies like that back in the early 80s, the Reagan years. Uh, for our writers, we had David Harmon returning. Mr. Harmon had his first produced Star Trek script with The Deadly Years, which we here on the Warp Core covered episode 51. You're going to want to go back and check out those archives, see what we thought of The Deadly Years. Everyone was aging, and we had fantastic makeup for our uh, crew, except for Leonard Nimoy, because Vulcans age slower than humans. Uh, and Mr. Harmon balanced that episode uh, surprisingly as something that could have really gone off the rails early, managed to give us uh, some real thoughtful tension and suspense. And, uh, and it, was, it was one of those that kind of snuck up on you. This one goes a little bit broader and they even have some nice looking dames uh, walking the streets and uh, hanging out in the billiards rooms. <clears throat> Basically, your elevator pitch, Star Trek meets Miller's Crossing by way of 1968 sensibilities. So everyone talks like they're gangsters from Brooklyn, uh, and there's a fine bit of overacting involved when you chomp on cigars, carry Tommy guns, and the like. Uh, we even had uh, Vic Tabak. You'll remember him from uh, Mel's Diner in the sitcom Alice, and also some guest appearances on The Love Boat. He played Krakow, uh, the second 
mobster that the Enterprise crew runs into. The first was Anthony Caruso. And maybe it's just this loyal viewer, but I was convinced I was seeing a, a step forward in time, uh, like the Guardians on, of Forever, showing me how Ben Gazzara would act in Patrick Swayze's Roadhouse in 1989, because that's what Anthony Caruso's his diction and the way he carried himself, it, it just was eerie. So maybe Mr. Gazzara was flipping through channels one night, saw this episode uh, in his recliner and said, hey, I dig what that guy's putting out. I'm going to figure out a way to, to use that. And he did to menace Patrick Swayze in a small Missouri town. Um, what can you really say, gentlemen? The the 1920s backlot, uh the Enterprise uh, trying to deal with a distortion of a contamination of the Prime Directive. Uh, you have Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, uh, you know, getting to, to mix it up with Chicago Toughs, would-be Chicago Toughs. You get to see Kirk and Spock in fedoras and suits. Uh, you get a record number of fascinatings from Leonard Nimoy in this episode. I counted at least three, if not more. And again, despite the inherent potential silliness of the premise, darned if you don't go along with it because it's clear that they're in on the joke too. And they stay always on the right side of that line between camp and genuine humor. It just comes right up to the edge, but never steps over it and into something negative. I mean, Kirk inventing a card game on the fly to uh, overpower some gangsters, fantastic. Uh, Anthony Caruso trying to use the communicator and saying, hey, you, in the ship up there. <laughs> and cut to Montgomery Scott's bewilderment at <laughs> everything that's coming out of that man's mouth. Um, it's there's even a plaque I think that that for Krakow when they or Krakow when they show up it is like you know as if all gangsters have like a plaque announcing you know their base of operations and so forth you know we the audience couldn't be clued in from the guys guarding it with Tommy guns you have a plucky street wise orphan uh, who wants a piece of the action uh, so it leaves no stone unturned but I mean. If you like that sort of thing, and you liked Al Capone and The Untouchables and Miller's Crossing and any number of gangster, you know, guys wearing spats and shooting pool and so forth, then this is exactly what the doctor ordered. And I think, you know, while William Shatner gets to indulge in William Shatnerisms, and I'm sure the crew will uh, bring that to light, it was, again, a great role for Leonard Nimoy to have to play basically the straight man. Uh, and his uncomfortable with, with you know, using the idioms and, and so forth of the period. And I do want to tee it up with you guys talking about uh, he and, and Spock behind the wheel uh, in this episode. That scene alone gave me a very Voyage Home Star Trek IV vibe. Uh, and I think those, those actors remembered that and used some of that when they did the you know, lost in San Francisco bit in 1986. Uh, but gentlemen, uh, what do you think? Did they score or uh, are the Flatfoots going to put them behind bars? <laughs> I mean, I got to say that uh, I think the comparison between this and Star Trek 4 is extraordinarily apropos because I got shades of Star Trek 4 the whole time. I mean, this is a very self-aware episode. I, I, I think it's entirely valid. I mean, you know, there's a lot of talk of the Prime Directive, even thus far in the series. But what does it really look like? We've never really seen them taint something and then have to come back and deal with it, right? So if you go by the book, I mean, of course, it could be a little zany, a little bit like, you know, out of the ordinary. Um, and... <laughs> You know, I think it's a it's a bit of convenience, of course. I'm sure these costumes were readily available. You know, this these are probably sets they were using for films at the time. So it's just, you know, how can we shoestring together an episode of Star Trek? Um, and I love that the cast seems in on it. Like, they're 
they're aware this is kind of absurd, which you would be. You know, and the thing is, you still have that suspension of disbelief because it doesn't go too far, but also because you kind of would expect them to find it a little funny. Like, a whole society that went around this one book, they're like, well, did they leave any other books? I'm like, yeah, technical manu manuals on how to build radios. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 kind of funny. I mean, if if you think about it from their point of view, it should be a little bit wacky and, and a little bit uh, silly. Uh, I love the car driving. Um, that to me, uh, absolutely is, uh, Captain. Why do you insist upon using colorful metaphors? <laughs> um, it, it, it's. Uh, I mean, th there's something to say about Star Trek when it takes you know, its silly side and puts it on the forefront. And I think this is a Desilu thing and, and a Gene Roddenberry thing because you can have very heavy subjects being discussed. And I think, you know, if, if you look at this from a, the perspective of, uh, you know, these next couple episodes deal with the perspective of our place in history at the time that this is being produced, right, in a certain sense, there there is some absurdity to it. When you, you think about the human condition at the time that this arose, you know, the Chicago gangsters and the next couple episodes touch on this as well. Um, it's, it's almost comic looking back. I mean, even for us now, we look back at the Chicago gangster time and you're like, really? Like they were like carving up areas of Chicago, Chicago, Chicago. Uh, sort of uh, arbitrarily. And, you know, it was like they were whacking each other left and right and, you know, hit on this and hit. Put them on, on ice. ice. I was, yeah. Everybody's getting these little catchphrases and things. And it's like, it seems a little silly. I mean, even for for right now, not all that far removed. I mean, if we're being real, like you know, thirty years, on the hundred years, you know, it's not <laughs> it's not that far off. So it it, it is kind of humorous, and I, I think it's it's interesting that if you think about you know, applying that same lens to modern times, you know, in, in Star Trek four, they go back to the late 1980s. And well, of course, like stuff that was happening in the eighties, like the punk on the bus <laughs> that happened probably pretty frequently is in big cities like San Francisco, New York city, whatever. And people did get annoyed. You kind of wish you could just reach over and just knock them out without having to be violent. I mean, that that's a funny thing they did. It's the same same concepts, and, and I think that's why I latched on to this, and I was enjoying myself the whole time. Now, is this like the groundbreaking, you know, self-reflective episode that Star Trek sometimes gives us? We're like, wow, what an amazing, you know, ponderance of the human condition. No, not really. This is definitely more of the, that's that's kind of funny. You know, it's, I yeah, it was, humans do silly things sometimes, even in the future. It's a little absurd sometimes, and that that is is just such a cool perspective to see, and to see it now, you really kind of buy in to where Nimoy and Shatner are at at the time. They're they're literally playing dress up at one point in this episode, just really for the fun of it. There's no no reason why they had to do this, um, and it just I, I I feel like you're watching an episode of I Love Lucy in a way. It's even got a little bit of that musical camp. It's got a bit of the uh, sort of offbeat sort of, you know, character looks at another character and they kind of know what's going on. Spock does it at one point where he's like, yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, 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 it's comedy in a way that is still super sci-fi, super Star Trek, um, but also very relatable. Uh, the audience at the time would have dug it. Clearly, it's one of the more popular episodes of the series, and it 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 borders on timeless, I would say, because I, we're watching it now, sixty years removed, roughly, and it it has not lost its its comedic edge nor its uh, examination edge uh, when it comes to just kind of slicing open a period of human history and, and kind of making light of it uh, in a, in a unique way. Yes. Um, and that's all I got, folks. Uh, no, but... It, it, I wish they would have seen Goodfellas and like done a 
Goodfellas version of it, which might have been maybe a little too saucy for the time. But, yeah, I mean, I, they got to be campy without really being that campy with it. And even Shatner is... is <laughs> The one it even made me snort. There we go. That's how good it was. But at one point, I noticed as the episode kept moving forward, Shatner was Shatnering it up even more. The further the the, the show progressed, right. like you know, but eh, she and like the whole thing playing that up. I I just feel like it was it was right in his wheelhouse to be able to do something like that, and Prime Directive, like what. What what happened? I, I, I'm 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 so confused. This episode made me even more confused about what the prime directive should have been for this because they're beaming people. Well, they beam just Krakow up to the ship, right? Is that the only guy they beamed up? Yeah. So they yeah they beamed him up so I guess he could be the one who saw what was going on and that they really have the starship. But now that's got to be completely messed with because he's seen all that now what could he really do with it obviously probably nothing but prime directive you're not supposed to do those kind of things and and i know we're going to see another episode down the line where the prime directive uh really gets messed up a little bit where they yeah it goes out the window um but i i like the star trek 4 idea that that this is just it almost seemed like a little bit of a playground for shatner and uh t- and Nimoy to just kind of take off with and, and it's another example of an episode that could have just gone off the rails and somehow it, it might have teetered here and there going around a bend every once in a while but they they kept it moving forward to make it to me an enjoyable episode like you guys said is it the greatest episode ever no is it the worst no I think they just you know Maybe hit a single, maybe a double here with this episode. Enough to keep you interested. Um, enough for you to kind of have some fun with it and have its few serious moments here and there. But I think overall it was, it was a solid episode for the entire cast. My uh, two favorite lines involve Kirk asking Spock about the odds of drawing a successful hand in this made-up game. And Spock just looking at him and saying, I've never computed those, Captain. Uh, which... Technically, was he wasn't telling a fib, or the guy when uh, uh, Krakow's men grab Kirk and they're like, "Let's go for a ride, buddy," you know, and he doesn't want to go, and he's like, "Look, this can be a taxi or it can be a hearse." I just thought that was just a, a real clever line there, so forth. Gene L. Kuhn, who was the show's showrunner, he co-wrote the episode with David Harmon, and we should mention this only because behind the scenes. He had transitioned out of his show running role and there wasn't a big fanfare. It just started appearing now in the last episode or two where John Meredith Lucas is now the credited producer at the end of each episode. And and Gene L. Kuhn will contribute to a couple more scripts, but he had basically given up the day to day running of the show. Uh, So it's John Meredith Lucas now and and DC Fontana and Roddenberry kind of steering it as you will so yeah i mean the the one who kind of gets the short shrift in all this is mccoy although he and spock do get successfully uh beamed up to the ship and then they they just it's a boneheaded move like they they beam back down i mean they've managed to escape and you know they seemingly have the upper hand and then they beam back down and get captured again and i i just wanted to smack my head because it's just like ah and of course, as they get captured again, we go to like the commercial break, you know, like the audience like, oh, no. But I, I just I was just like, oh, come on, guys, really? Like you had to go through such trouble to get back up to the ship. And now you're just going to go right back into the lion's den. But then we wouldn't have Spock dressed in a fedora and and uh, and a suit and so forth there. So, uh, well, it's something to be said, too, because it doesn't have that tropey, convenient we got out of it thing you know they they're they're basically foiled three or four times throughout the episode by these chicago gangsters <laughs> who uh ain't never seen none of them heaters like he got there <laughs> he 
And let me tell you, it's 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 kind of like it's silly, but at the same time, it's it's kind of true to life. Like if you ran into a primitive society, you're really trying not to screw up. Chances are you're going to walk yourself into a couple of them walls. And I I hate to say it, but it's very clever writing um, because it's all it's also something to be said about Star Trek. Just no matter which iteration. There's a lot of convenience. Like, conveniently, Data has superhuman strength. You know, con conveniently, um, you know, the captain always seems to outsmart the godlike beings. And that's like every captain in every series, always. You know, conveniently, you know, somehow, you know, two old farts are able to commandeer a whole vessel and take it wherever they want it, even though the captain has explicitly told them no. <laughs> you know, there's there's a lot of convenience, and I could see where a non-Trekkie, like maybe a uh, maybe one of our graying Jedi fans, <clears throat> as the old system used to be, you had to be a fan of one or the other. You couldn't do both like we do. Um, they might point at this and say, you know, it's very convenient. All of these outs. Spock and McCoy escape, they lock on to Kirk, they get him out of there, it's resolved, they leave. Well, no, they actually have to provide some resolution. They have to clean this up. Um, kind of like, you know, Luke not just going and killing Darth Vader. Like, he's he's going to try and save him, and he kind of ends up getting himself deeper and deeper into the mud hole until, you know, something convenient happens. And, I mean, it, it's still... Yeah, you're still aiming for a happy ending, you know. There's there's very little complexity to it at the end of the day. But, um, you know, it would be very easy for, you know, the whole group to kind of get out of it and be like, well, let me tell you, that was a sucker of a deal, you know. But they come up with something, and it's still pretty silly. It's still pretty comic, you know. Well, you know, the Enterprise and uh, the Federation are taking over. <laughs> and... Uh, we're not going to get in on these small-time games. So we're going to leave y'all in charge. It's like, really? Come on. Are they listening to what they're hearing? <laughs> but, again, primitive society. Of course they are. They're playing by the rules of the game. So, um, I mean, just tremendous, tremendous writing, top to bottom. That, that card scene, by the way, reminded me of <laughs> the scene from Stripes where John Candy's like, come on, bluff me. Go ahead, bluff me. I, see? There you go. I <laughs> it, was like, it, it, it was just it was just that was the thought that was going through my head just john candy like making up the rules so he could take that poor kid's money and stripes and the same thing is happening here with you know with kirk making up all these rules when they're playing the card game so that was something that kind of had popped into my head that i thought was pretty funny well and who hasn't done that to like a little kid or something like made up a card game because they want to play a game but you're just like i i, I don't know i gotta come up with something other than slapjack <laughs> yeah. I probably that's invented easy. Uno, so it's just I, I, I'm convinced of that. <laughs> so, I mean, all things considered, I, I think we we have a very positive outlook on this episode. But it is, as is our tradition here on the Warp Core podcast, which you would know if you are one of our one thousand subscribers here at Pending Rebrand, on our mission to explore all strange. Star Treks and new Star Treks and all Star Treks, hit that subscribe button if not. But let's go through our Warp Core ratings for this episode. And we'll start as we often start with Lord Uther. Oh, I, I get to start. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to go I'm going to go four. Uh, no. I'll go 4.5. I'll be a little more generous. I can't give it a 5. It was it was above average. It kept my interest. It wasn't something that I got up and walked away from like I actually have with a couple of episodes that we've uh, reviewed. Alternative here. factor. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, God. Oh. Um, but again, you know, I, just a solid episode. Not something, and I think we've kind of had this discussion before too, obviously. Not something I would want to used to introduce someone to original series, but an episode that you could put in front of a Trek fan and they would enjoy it. So I will go four and a half. With that, I will uh, hand it over to Furt to see what he uh, is going to rate this one. 
Well, I'm two hours behind you, gentlemen, in the space-time continuum. So I think that gives extra gravity. I, I understand the gravity of my situation. I'm going to go five and a half. I don't think it reaches that rarefied air of a six or a seven. Uh, but I think, I think it does play its cards right, even if it seems like they're just making it up as they go. Uh, and like I said, I, I've always been a fan of tough guy, Dashiell Hammett, 30s, you know, dialogue. Uh, it is timeless, as Ursa Master points out. And, and uh, even if it's delivered with a wink and a smile, uh, it's still, is, it's, it's poetry. It's the cadence of the streets. And uh, there is something alluring and intoxicating uh, when it's when it's pulled off in a way that that entertains you. So I'm going to go five and a half here uh, on this one and say, yes, you definitely want a cut of this action. Love it. And I will get in on a piece of the action as well. I would give this a solid five and a half warp cores as well. Um, I, I, I agree it's not a six is basically why. Um, I was entertained thoroughly by this episode. It was uh, it was not an episode I would say you have to watch to understand the original series. But it is definitely one that if you were needing uh, something to break up maybe the heavier episodes, which I think are ones you need to watch, the sixes and sevens, and you need something a little lighter, palate cleanser type episode that's still really solid or if you're just a star trek 4 fan as much as i am uh, it was probably my favorite star trek movie for a very long time and it's you know bounced back and forth with that in generations um i'm gonna i'm gonna say this is this is a great episode for fans like me um i i'm also self-aware and I, I i would love to give it a six but i gotta be honest it's not foundational this is a playground um this this is maybe if you were a, a group of kids half of them want to play gangsters half of them want to play star trek this is what you get on the playground you get an episode like this where kirk and spock and mccoy have to play with the gangsters and it's playful uh and enjoyable um you know no george takei a little sad about that. I feel like he would have had fun in this Still episode. shooting the Green Berets um, as, as we speak here. Still shooting the Green Berets. What a misstep in his <laughs> career. But um, I still thoroughly enjoyed it. And I think, you know, all of you pending rebrand subscribers out there, go out and watch this. Do yourself a favor. Log into Paramount+. Plus. If you don't have it, go to your local thrift store and pick up the VHS copy. And a VACR while you're at it, and just pop in the original. You don't need any effects for this episode. There is literally just a beam of light that happens once, uh, and a couple of phaser bursts. You will not be disappointed. This will be a good laugh. The whole family can enjoy. Uh, and then make yourself a ham sandwich, take a load off, and live long and prosper.